Joining us tonight is a great wrestler from the 80s and 90s and a true pioneer in women's wrestling. We're going to have fun tonight. we got Heidi Lee Morgan. Heidi, welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see you again, Heidi. This is going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> I, I'm very humbled that you reached out to do this, and uh, I can't wait to share some of my journey. Awesome. You know, when I started doing research on you, I didn't know you were a second-generation wrestler. Yeah, I'm really, so there's a lot of people that are not aware that I was second generation wrestler. Uh, my pops was the original Little Abner back in the uh, early 70s. And he was also always, him and my mom always had some type of their own business going on. But he was, my dad was a huge, huge wrestling fan. I mean, when I tell you, a true diehard fan. He knew who's who's. It's only been probably the last 10 years he has not followed it. Uh, but prior to that, he knew who was in, who was doing what, what the angles were, what, where and where, and what was going down. And he was a big Buddy Rogers fan. And um, so because of all of that, uh, his love as a kid uh, went into his adult years of wrestling and back in his generation they had territories and it was capital wrestling so which was Vince McMahon senior and he did a lot of stuff in the South Jersey area with him and that's where I made my debut as Daisy May where I would bring out our little piglet Susie due to the ring and my dad never let us kids hang out at the ring when they wrestled. So I would come out with Susie, the piglet, and um, do our little gig. And then I'd go back to the dressing room because he was fear, like in fear that we would get hurt. But yeah, we played in the ring with uh, Chief J Strongbow's kids, uh, Robert Morelli, Gorilla Monsoon's kid, Robert Morelli and my dad were very good friends. And um, Joey and my sister were the same age. Valerie and I were the same age. Uh, Valerie wasn't really into playing in the ring like the rest of us kids were. And I was the smallest out of the group. So they're like, climb up to the top and do this and do that. So at five, six years old, I'm like, okay. And I would. So, yeah. Yep. Did your dad discourage you to get involved in wrestling? Was he for it? Against it. He was yeah. against it. He really, because he felt like the women were, my dad is, <laughs> at putting it nicely, my dad is a female chauvinist where he had sisters, a big woman's right at the, at, uh, advocate my dad is. So he just always believed uh, women can do many things that men can do, plus have babies and not cry over it. And that's why God allowed women to have babies because a man couldn't handle it for my dad, who's going to be 82 years old. And um, he was against it. He was for me with the lifting weights and the competing that way because he felt like I had more of an opportunity. He just did not want me to be abused or misused in the industry because he just felt like the women didn't get the respect that they truly deserved. Yeah, people who are watching these days, they don't understand. They probably don't even understand what you're saying. There was no women division back then. It was, it was all the men wrestling and on the bottom of the poster also appearing women in midgets yep. or you know, you were lucky to get a spot on a show. Now you watch Monday Night Raw, and there's two, three women matches. So, yeah, I mean, rightfully so. Your dad's got to be concerned because there's just, just not a lot of, not a lot of opportunities for women back then. No, we were considered. Uh, we colored the card. We were the highlight of the card, and um, you know, hindsight, looking at it, uh, a lot of the men did not like. They didn't, um, I, I don't want to say this in a negative way. So let me think, let me respond instead of reacting. Okay. So um, in my generation, we were to highlight the card. When I came along, I kind of was a pioneer for my generation because I stepped out of the comfort zone on how a female was supposed to dress. It was trying to pave the way, but we were we were there to color the card. That's what my generation was. But we were we pushed up as hard as we could for what the industry would allow us to do. 
Okay, tell me about Mula. So she actually broke you in? Mm -hmm. Okay. How'd you yeah. get hooked up with her? Yeah, so how I winded up going to her school was from doing public relations and uh, advertisement. My folks had um, have a business. Uh, they manufactured paint remover and back then were very successful with private labeling. And that was in 85. We went and got permit. And that was the year that WrestleMania pops, all the craziness. So we went to go up to Stanford to receive permission to use Hogan to promote the product with me because I had won five at that time, five first place trophies for bodybuilding. And Vince took a look at me and looked at my picture and, you know, here I am, you know, I just turned 19 years of age and he says, you want to wrestle? I'm like, no, not at all. <laughs> I, I'm competing in bodybuilding. I, and he's like, well, how about if you do some bodybuilding exhibitions in between matches you know, that way we have more women on the car because we don't have women bodybuilder in the industry. And I think it would be good for where we're going in this industry. And of course, I'm like, when, where, how? And September 28th began my journey with WWF. They, they were called WWF at the time, where from September all the way up until April, I was going to the different arenas, uh, Pittsburgh Arena, uh, up to Boston. It was like one show a month where I would go and I would do my 90 second routine. I shared a dressing room each time with Macho Man and Miss Elizabeth, um, which is how I became like, uh, you know, the the old cliche was when I did work for WWE in 93, 94, Randy looked at me like I was his kid. And Alundra Blaze was just like blown away by that. She's like, I don't know what it is, but like, he was very protective when he's, are you with me? Who's touching me? I was like, no one's bothering me, you know? So it was really precious. And uh, I cherished those moments on the road that I got with, with him. And, um, uh, Miss Elizabeth, like like I said, I didn't travel with them back then. I would just go to the arena and meet them and share the dressing room with them. And uh, they all knew that nobody was going to touch us. Randy was like on patrol, like the best bodyguard you could ever have. And uh, so I'm honored that I could do that. And then when I finally decided that I was going to wrestle because WWE, uh, a gentleman, Mark, who was in charge of their marketing, was on and off the phone with my mom three, four times a week because we got permission to use Paul Orndorff as a, our spokesperson. God rest his soul. Um, so from that uh, is how I... You know, they my mom says, listen, it's not like it was when your dad was wrestling, blah, blah, blah. And my dad, my dad even said to my mom, I still really don't want her to do it because it's not where it needs to be. Like she's still even though they're saying they want her, you know, as soon as she goes to school, it might take her two, three years before she gets back because you can't just like you need to be polished. Right. And so I agreed uh, the best school to work for WWE back then. You had to go to Mullis School. So I went to Columbia, South Carolina. I learned by the best. I lived there. Um, Mullis School was no joke. Anybody that ever went to Mullis School that truly survived it was five. You, like you live there. You If you were just a weekend warrior, the women that were there, like Judy Leilani, Sue Sexton, uh, Velvet McIntyre, they're like, yeah, they're not like it. They they didn't look at them as in the same category. And I hate saying that, but it's the truth. So if you just came down during the weekends and played at Mula School, those women didn't look at you as a real wrestler. Like you had to stay there, put your dues in, give up your whole life to do this like they did for them to look at you as being a real wrestler. And I'm not discrediting any female that went to Mula school, but if they were just weekend warriors, this is how that generation thought. And that's still, you're not going to change their mind because, and you can be a big wrestling fan and still involved in this sport, but that industry of women that I respected, and it's important that they in return respect me because that means the world to me. Um, you know, if you didn't hang, you weren't considered a real mula girl. 
You know what I mean? So some people can say that they went there, but unless you were there and lived there, you won't considered Camp Mula girl. So I was the last, and I put it in quotes, and Judy will tell you, Leilani will tell you, if Val, if if, if uh, Luna was alive, she would tell you. I was the last of Mula's Camp Mula girls, period. There was no one after me because after I left, that was it. Like she really didn't do much with any women wrestlers beyond that because now Sherry comes into WWE from AWA and finally broke that wall and barrier down. Now Mula still had, you know, they still had respect for Mula, of course, because of the, you know, the time spent and what was earned, but Mula no longer had control of the women after I left is the point I'm trying right. to make. How did you get along with Mula? Um, I, you know what? I'm pretty lucky. Um, when I went to Mula June of 1986, all the women, Judy and Leilani, were over in Japan wrestling with the All Japan Women Wrestling. All the other women, Velvet McIntyre, uh, Black Venus, Sue Star, and all of them, uh, they were in uh, Egypt with WWF. They were, you know, that's when they started going overseas. So they had gone to Africa, to Egypt, and the women, you know, that were at Camp Mula had all been booked to go there. So the only ones left at Camp Mula was Katie the Midget and um, Mula herself. Uh, Donna Crescentelli at the time, she was also over um, in Egypt with everybody else because they were doing, uh, I think it was a six girl tag team or something like that. And uh, so for honestly, when I first arrived at Mula's school, they had all been gone for quite some time. So I had Mula to myself for two weeks and it was really in incredible to say that Mula at the time was turning 60 she was 63 turning 64 the summer of 19 mm -hmm. yeah because her birthday's in July she's a cancer too like I am and that just left yeah that just left an impression on my head you know and um you know, Mula herself is only five foot three, but she was wide. So she didn't look like she was so short because of how stocky she was. Right. But she I was so impressed that this woman took beautiful bomb. Uh, my dad and I uh, went to Robert Morelli. Uh, house. We had a meeting and my contract was done with her in December. Anyhow. And the, the choice I had to make was, do I stay in South Carolina in January and let her book me? Or do I come home and let her book me from New Jersey? So Gorilla Monsoon, Robert Morelli's like, you can, she can book you from New Jersey. You're closer to Stanford than she is. So, and he says, but I will tell you this, she's going to play one of these little hard games because now you're not going to be on her property running from her. So now she can't control you. So just understand the chain of events that are going to occur. So it might take you another year or two to get back to WWF, but be patient. You will. And that's what I did. So when I went back down right after Thanksgiving break, I told Mula what the plans were. And she says, well, hon, if you want to work for WWF, you got to live here with me. And I said, no, no, I don't. That's where you're wrong. I said, you can book me from New Jersey. I'm closer there. You'll still get your 25%. You're just not going to get any rent from me. My contract with you is done December. And I did my six months of schooling and I'm coming home. So you can use me or you not use me. I said, but mark my words, I will be back to WWE or F whether you choose to book me or not by hook or by crook without being married to one of the boys, without having sex with one of the boys, I will be back there by my own qualifications. And it took me seven years to get back there. <laughs> But I made it back. <laughs> so that's my story about Mula. I don't have anything else negative to say. I did run into her when I was working for WWE at WrestleMania 10. They brought me into Madison Square Garden to sign autograph pictures. 
And um, me and The Undertaker were right next to each other, which I thought was the coolest thing. I got paid to look cute. Uh, I got to watch the match. I got to see Mula. And uh, I said, well, I made, she says, well, hello, hon. And I'm like, hello, Mula, how you doing? She says, I'm fine. Well, she says, well, look where we're at. I said, yep, Madison Square Garden. Guess what, Mula? I made it. I made it without screwing anybody, without being married with anybody, without selling my soul. She says, oh, hon, I knew you would. I said, did you really? I said, did you really? Just like that. I wasn't rude or obnoxious. I'm like, did you really? And she just looked at me and smiled. She says, well, you're here. And I said, that's right. I am here. You know, and I just thought, you know, that's the only thing that I will ever say negative about her because that's my story. I don't have anything else negative to say about her. Um, I thought it was really cool that I got to learn off of the best, one of the best in the industry and icon of icons. I mean, come on, right? 64 years of age, you know, teaching me how to take bumps and combinations. That's incredible. You know, how many people can say they can do that? You know what I mean? So I'm honored. Um, the other stories that transpired, there are the other women in the industries to share, not mine, because it wasn't me living that. Um, so it's their story. That's my story. So when you came back, you came back in for the, uh, the introduced the women's title back into the picture. They had a lunge of blaze. They had Luna. They had Bon Nakano. What was that experience like for you? So there's more women that were involved, and that's what I've been pushing up on this year. This year marks 30 years of Monday Night Raw, okay? Um, that Monday Night Raw was introduced on USA TV, okay? And Monday Night Raw is still going strong, right? Well, in the fall, they decided, J.J. Dillon was in the office at the time, and they decided that they were going to have a women's title championship bout. And so initially, um, someone else's misfortune was my luck. So Misty Blue was one of the, Misty Blue was supposed to go against Alundra Blaze. And something happened that, again, is not my story to sell. I mean, I know the truth behind it, but I'm not going to disclose it. But Misty was not able to compete against Alundra. OK. And um, so I was already asked, did I want to be part of this? And it was Rusty the Fox Thomas went against Babyface Nelly. Um, Babyface Nelly lost. Uh, Gene Kirkland wrestled. Black Venus wrestled somebody. That person lost. Then I wrestled Black Venus. Black Venus lost against me. Then I wrestled Rusty the Fox Thomas. And then after I wrestled Rusty the Fox Thomas, then I wrestled Alundra. So that was the lineup that nobody really knows about. Um, but that is how the pyramid progressed. And it was over um, a couple of television tapings. We were in the dark matches, so I don't know if they have them in the archives or not. And then from there, <clears throat> Alundra Blaze and I went against each other for the women's match because Misty backed out of it. So because Misty backed out, I was the next person in line. That's how that opportunity came. So Misty's misfortune was my blessing because then I did work against Alundra, but then um, Art Anderson, not Art Anderson, our Ani Skoland and Chief, uh, Chief J Strongbow, especially Chief J Strongbow, um, they just, and Tony Gurria, they were watching the matches and they're like, holy Christmas, like that little, that little girl, that little bodybuilder there can work. Right. And, um, they're like, she's not a heel. Like you guys are trying to make her a heel. She's a face. And they were trying to put a lunger over as a face. And she was always a heel. Right. So, um, they decided to, they started playing around, bringing Candy, uh, not Candy, um, Debbie Combs, who's another incredible icon. She came in, was wrestling for WWE. Uh, that was the January of 94. And then WrestleMania was that 94 also, which is where I signed the autographs. And she wrestled, um, 
uh, Leilani Kai, and then they brought Bull Nakana in, and uh, I wrestled Bull. Uh, I wrestled Bull, and uh, Alondra wrestled Bull that night as well. And Bull, there was the timing was off, and Alundra Bull landed on Alundra's face. And they were scheduled for two weeks out, and Alundra couldn't do it because her face was swollen. So Tony Gurria and Chief Jay Strongbow and, and Alundra are like, you got to do this. Bull's here. They're paying for her. You got to wrestle her. And I'm like, uh, I'm uh, okay. So I agreed. I agreed to work. I, I agreed to fill in again. Alundra's misfortune was my fortune. And when they saw that her and I were poetry in motion and I had never met the woman, we couldn't even speak the language. We just flowed without even being able to communicate. And Chief Jay Shongbo says, oh my God, like uh, we found Tinkerbell. We found Tinkerbell. And because of that, that's why they brought us back in as a tag team, me and Alundra. And they were starting to build that up and uh, we, I mean, a lot of people don't know, but in January of 95, we were supposed to do the Royal Rumble. And that's when I found out I was pregnant, but they were going to, they were going to dub us champions. And um, I got pregnant and I had a choice. Uh, I was told I couldn't have kids and it was like, have a baby or do the, um, do Royal Rumble take a chance Luna kicking me and have a miscarriage and Anne was Pat Patterson's secretary and she says well nobody has to know because you can't even tell you're pregnant you know just do the do the Royal Rumble do the um um with all the women the um oh my gosh I just went brain dead Michael uh battle royal do the battle royal and then it was going to come down to me and Alundra left in the ring right and then they were going to build something up from there so it was a really cool angle and I just remember crying and crying and crying and I'm like I don't even know what to do and I chose to have my little girl um who's going to be eight, 28 years of age now <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, yeah so yeah so that's that's how that happens <laughs> like working with, uh, Medusa what's that how did you like working with Medusa I loved working with Medusa Medusa was fun to work with I liked working with Medusa more as a baby face and her as the heel especially when she was with AWA um and uh it was it was enjoyable because her type of wrestling was different than what I was used to. Even it was even a little bit more different than like Debbie Combs, even what I had experienced with the women working in Japan. And I really think her working in Japan really made her an incredible worker, which made it more enjoyable when she came back to Japan from Japan to work against her. Talk to me about your, your injury, because when you hurt your back, that was basically it for you, correct? It was. So that was in 1997 in Pennsylvania. Hager's, uh, no, um, wait a minute. Oh, I, I just went brain dead on the town. Uh, we were Hazleton, Hazleton, Pennsylvania. There you go. It was for Alpha. Uh, the Samoans, the wild Samoans, they used to have a wrestling school in Allentown. I don't know if they still do or not. I know they're, I know Alf and Sika were down in Florida because they are my friends on Facebook. Um, but I did a lot of shows for, oh, that's another one. I did a lot of shows for Papa. Papa paid good. He took care of the girls. Uh, he never disrespected us women. I have to say he was one of the gentlemen promoters and wrestlers that didn't. Um, loved working for him. And um, I had my daughter. My daughter is now uh, two years old. And because I had her 95. So now you're looking at the winter of 97. My daughter's birthday is in September. Alpha hits me up and he says, um, uh, I got a show. I, I know that you're trying to get polished again to go back to WWE because now they're WWE. He says, um, 
you know, uh, that's when they were going, just switching it back over to, you know, losing the name of WWF. And he says, I know that uh, you're looking to maybe think about going back in. And he says, I got a new girl, Kathy. Uh, do you mind working her? Uh, and I said, well, what do you pay? And he says, 200. And I said, sure, you know, I'll make a day out of it. So um, I went up and um, it was her very first match. And anybody that knows theater, if you know theater arts, if sometimes people, when they get in front of an audience, they black out. And that's exactly what happens. So in the beginning of her match, she shoots me into the turnbuckle. I go flying into the turnbuckle. I jump up. She comes running in. As she's coming in, I jump up to, to miss her. I sit on her and I was supposed to lock her head with my legs in a, in, in a figure four with my legs and do a back bend underneath her legs to roll her up. And it's a beautiful maneuver. I did it tons of times on Bull Nakano and it's been on USA TV for Monday Night Raw show, right? So it's a beautiful, beautiful maneuver. But the problem is, is she blacked out because she freaked out in front of 150 people, right? So like some people just, they get gun shy. She got gun shy. She shot me in, she froze, and I could feel the hesitation. And this is where being a mom, a new mom, I never had fear ever, ever when I did gymnastics, no matter how many times I landed on my head, missing the balance beam, no matter how many times I've been dropped in my head in the wrestling ring from a match or practicing, I'd get up, I'd laugh like I had no sense. Well, now I'm a mommy to a two-year-old and all I could think is, is my daughter needs me, right? Like that was my, she became my fear right? I need to live for my daughter. So I feel this hesitation in the corner. I'm like, this is not going to be good. I am not even going to do the back bend. So my instinct says, reach for the rope. As I reach for the rope, she throws herself back. As she threw herself back, I was literally sitting on her, her head in between my legs, just like I'm facing you now and her head between you and I, and she falls back. So now she falls back on me. And my legs are trapped and I could hear my back crack. It sounded like an adjustment. And she was 170 pounds. And again, I was 125 pounds because I was always that weight in the wrestling industry. And my legs were so intertwined around her neck that finally after she fell back, landed on me, we both flipped over. Then I could release my legs. Then I felt like the wind was knocked out of me. So I rolled out of the ring. Then I'm like, I can't move. Like, I cannot move. And it was December 20th, a couple of days before Christmas. Uh, the EMTs came. They made us sign a release form that I refused treatment because I knew I was going to be stuck in the hospital because I was stuck in the hospital up until Christmas Eve. But what happened was my sparring coach, which was Artie Palmer, uh, who's married to Amy Lee Palmer, Amy Lee uh, in wrestling. Uh, he's married to her. He was my sparring coach when I came home from Mula. So all my high flying, all my um, shooting came from him on how to protect myself, him and my dad. But my dad did a lot of shoot on self-defense and Artie. Um, so Artie and my dad had gone to me, gone with me to that show. Had they not, God only knows where I would have been. That play, uh, Hazleton, Pennsylvania is actually two hour, two hours and 20 minutes from my house to there. We made it back to the Vineland Hospital in exactly 80 minutes. That's how fast Artie was driving. And um, my husband at the time, I was only married once. We've been divorced five years now, broke my heart. Um, he met us at the hospital because he was, he stayed home with our daughter, right? And that basically, I'm like, thank God he had insurance because he was, a, at the time, he what he just, you know, he would, had been at the facility for like uh, eight, nine months as a, uh, as a CO, a correctional officer for the DOC. So thank God we had good health care because it cost $25,000 for me to make $200 that night. And Alpha did, 
Alpha did pay me. And shortly thereafter, like a year later, I did do, I went and emceed an all girls show with Candy Devine, Peggy Lee Weather, Bambi, uh, Judy Martin, Leilani Kai, Kathy was there, which was one of Alpha's girls. And I emceed it. And I just knew that, like, I didn't, like, I, I was known for aerial flying at that time. I, I, now I'm having limitations on my movement and I did not ever want to hear anyone said I'm a has been. Um, I much rather be a, like, I much rather be known for what I could do instead of embarrassing myself and getting in the ring, not being able to do what I could do. So that's why I choose not to wrestle because I'm not going to give anybody power over me and what my ability was and compare me today to what I could do because it's not the same person. The actual injury, what did you break? I broke, um, I, so I broke, uh, my lower lumbar three, four, and five. And the way they broke, it was a perfect L away from my spinal column. And I was literally in a body brace for six months from my breast down to keep it all locked in. Yeah. Yeah. So it was no joke. Yeah. Merry Sweet. Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> But it didn't stop me, you know? It didn't stop me. I mean, um, I... I remember like Missy Sampson, Peg, um, Amy Lee Palmer, uh, Amy Lee was not Amy Lee Palmer at the time. They were coming to my wrestling school we had because we let wrestlers come and just practice like we would run out the ring. So they had a place to spar. And um, I had the brace on and Artie says, I got a couple of people. Do you mind? And I'm like, no, Uncle Art, because I call him Uncle Art. I'm like, no, let, let him come in. And here I am with a brace on. And like, that's not how you do it. This is and I, I remember taking a freaking bump with my brace on and they're looking at me like, is does that make any sense? But I wanted to make sure they knew how to do the bump clean. I'm like, that's not how you do it. You're going to snap your neck. You got to do it this way. You know, uh, you do stuff young and stupid, right? <laughs> Tell us I was about 233 at the time when that happens. Yeah. Plug all your stuff. Tell us, uh, Tell us about your radio show. Tell us where people could find you. If, if you want to be found, tell I, us how to find you. Absolutely. So I, I will tell you, I am a, I'm an educator for planet fitness. And I say that proud because I've always been in the health industry all of my life and I'm doing what my ordained gift is that God gave me that I've been doing since I've been 15, but now I'm finally actually doing what I am ordained to do. So I'm not the world's best trainer, but I'm the world's best educator on how to move. I've been blessed by the state of New Jersey when I work with the mentally and physically disabled for the state of New Jersey. The state paid me to get educated on how to educate and work with those with physical disabilities to get them to Special Olympics. So for nine years, I went and took, you know, we're section eight of South Jersey to Trenton State we would take anywhere from seven to uh, 12 residents uh, for field and track. And then I also was a main coach for uh, bowling. And I learned through the state of New Jersey how to work with people with disabilities to show you you can move and you can live and be a productive individual in this life, even if you have disabilities. So I've been with Planet Fitness now for over uh, five and a half years working for them. I'm a manager for seven different facilities I work with. And I'm a head educator at Vineland Location. But I also have an incredible talk show called Women Encouraging Women, W-O-M-A-N, Encouraging Women, W-O-M-A-N, one woman at a time. I'm live on Cruising 92.1 FM, WVLT. I also have 13 episodes out on YouTube. You can just type in Heidi Lee Morgan Pro Wrestler and those will shoot up. I've interviewed judges. Matter of fact, the one judge, she was just uh, 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 
She just took her oath to be a superior, a, a, a superior court judge. And I'm pretty proud because I also train her. Um, so I met, met all these incredible women with all these incredible journeys from wrestlers to judges to attorneys. And it's live and you can catch it on uh, Facebook. And also you can uh, see me on Facebook. Uh, it's Heidi Lee Morgan to Barks and the Maze. I will tell the fans out there, if you get rude and ignorant and talk anything sexual, I will block you and call you out on it. That's not what I'm about. I'm not a piece of meat. I am a grown woman that has integrity and honor and that's how I will treat you so my wrestling fans that's what I would say is just be respectful mindful of that but thank you for asking <laughs> well I hope this was respectful and mindful I hope you had a good time catching up and telling some of your stories Heidi this is great for me uh, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, back. I, I didn't tell you this either. I forgot. I was there for a lot of those TV tapings. I used to do jobs all the time. So I saw you wrestle uh, Alundra and I saw you wrestle tag matches with Luna in the back. And, you know, you're always, like I said, at the start of the show, you're a true pioneer for women wrestling and innovator. And I thank you for all you've done for wrestling. And I thank you for your time tonight, Heidi. This was great.